21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. Yes? Where? 3120? In the barn grill. Now, who shot? What's his name? Where's the man with the gun? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve Which center. Way? A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. I'll send the officers. What? Talk into the phone. It's on its way. The ambulance is already on its way. Just wait there for the officers. Twenty-first precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the hundred and seventy-three thousand people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the twenty-first. Whether they know it or not, the security of their persons, their homes, and their property is my job. My job and the job of the 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. Uh, 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 I was working my 6 p.m. to 8 a.m. tour. It was a hot, muggy night. After I turned out the platoon for the late tour, I went on patrol of the precinct with patrolman Johnny Farrell as operator and myself as recorder. At 2.55, we were driving south on Lexington Avenue in the 70s. There were few cars on the street and fewer pedestrians. All right, cut across east on 72nd, Johnny. We'll take a turn up first. Yes, sir. 88, What was the matter with your boy, Johnny? I don't know, Captain. And now would be the doctor. 75, A rash off. like that could be yeah. caused by anything. Something he ate or one of his toys or weed or something. Hard to tell. Yeah, I know. And to keep him from scratching. How are you going to keep a kid five years old from scratching in his sleep unless you're trying to... Well, there's somebody running. Huh? Where? This side, down on the next block. Oh, yeah. Let's take a look. The man. Pull up ahead of him. Police officer. Watch your hurry. No. Hold up. I was running to the police station. Okay, Captain. Yeah. Well, tell me, mister. Hold up, guys. They stopped my boss. Where? Bar and grill. He's dead. I think he's dead. And where were you running? To the police station. What was the matter with the phone? I don't know. I was so excited, I guess. What's your name? Charlie. Charlie Burgess. I, I'm the bartender. Okay. Get in the car. Open it off, Al. Yes, sir. He, he looked dead to me. All right. Get in, Charlie. You go around, Johnny. Yes, sir. Where is this? The bar and grill, two blocks up. Oh, what's the street address? 3120. 3120, Johnny. Yes, sir. The two guys were there for an hour almost. Poor chap. All right, 620. Go ahead, 620. We've picked up a man who reports a robbery and shooting at the bar and grill, 3120 Lexington. 3120. That's right. We've got the witness. We're on our way. Okay. You, uh... You were running to the police station? Yeah, that's right. Police station's in the other direction. 216, car 631, 632. The address 3120. All right, come on, Charlie, let's go. Come on. I didn't know where the police station was. How should I know? Inside, Charlie. She's over there behind the bar. How come the music? Hold up, guys. Put a couple of quarters in the jukebox. I don't know. There. Is he dead? Yeah, he's dead. Here's the gun, Captain. Over here. All right, let it lay, pal. And pull the plug on that jukebox. That's it. Cash register's clean now. Why'd they shoot him, Charlie? I don't know. Happened so fast, I don't know. Where were you standing? Uh, right here, right by the beer tap. You were the bartender? Yeah, that's right. Substitute, the regulars on vacation. Why didn't they shoot you? I ducked. I ducked down behind the bar. If you were the bartender, what did you do? Change into your street clothes after the shooting? No. Dutch said I could go home early. Business was slow, I could go home, so I changed. Well, if you changed, what were you doing behind the bar? It was my last night. I came back here so Dutch could give me my money. 
Absolutely. No uh, other customers around when it happened? No, just the two hypers. Hey, what is this, anyhow? That's what we want to know from you, Charlie. What it is. Two sector cars, the sergeant's car, detectives from the 21st squad, and an ambulance arrived on the scene almost immediately. As required in homicide cases, Lieutenant Matt King, commanding the 21st squad, was called from his home. Also notified were the Manhattan East Homicide Squad, the Medical Examiner's Office, the New York County District Attorney's Office, the Police Laboratory for Latent Fingerprint Experts, and a police photographer, and such superior officers of the department as were concerned. Premises were completely examined for latent fingerprints and other physical evidence. The apparent murder gun, carefully handled, was tagged for evidence by the laboratory men for ballistics and fingerprint examination. The body of the victim was taken to Bellevue Morgue for autopsy. At 10 minutes to 4 a.m., Lieutenant King brought Charles Burgess to the station house for a detailed account. There in the 21st squad, he was questioned by Lieutenant King in his office in the presence of Assistant District Attorney Lewis Curley, two detectives, and myself. Now, you said the two bandits were average height. Yes, sir. Tell me what you mean, Charlie, by average height. Average height? They weren't too big, they weren't too small. Would you say they were as tall as I am? A little taller, maybe. About as tall as Captain Kennelly? About, yeah. Yeah, I guess. Both of them? And they were about the same height? Well, one was a little taller than the other. It was only a little. Which one? The one that fired the shot? Yeah, the one that fired the shot, he was a little taller. You told Captain Kennelly on the scene that the other one was a little taller. Isn't that right, Captain? That's what he said. Well, one of them was a little taller. What are you trying to do to me, anyway? You're getting a little confused, Charlie. Well, this whole thing is enough to confuse anybody. Here, Charlie. Have a cigarette. Yeah, I, I could use one. What is our squad? Did they shouldn't be confusing if you're giving us the facts. That's all well, I'm giving you is the facts. The facts. That's all right. I'm telling you what happened. What else do you want from me? Okay, fine. Nothing else, Charlie. Well, that was the ME's office with a preliminary report, Lieutenant. Yeah. Two bullet wounds, one through the right shoulder, the other entered the left arm, went through the chest, and pierced the heart. That was the baby. Stand up a minute, Charlie. Me? Yeah, you. Stand up. Whitey. Yeah, Lieutenant? Come over here a minute. Yeah, yeah sure, Lieutenant. Now, Charlie, supposing Detective Howard was the holdup man with a gun. Well, that's good, Whitey, right there. Supposing, Charlie, you were Dutch. Yeah, Dutch. About where was Dutch standing from the holdup man when the shots were fired? Uh, was uh, about here, I'd say. Uh-huh. Where were you standing, Charlie? About right over there. But the bar ran along this way. Captain, would you be Charlie? Yeah, sure. Right uh, about here? Yeah, right about there. Mm-hmm. I could show you better if I was myself. I want you to be Dutch. Yeah, Dutch. All right, now the holdup man fired the first shot. Bang. It hit Dutch in the right shoulder. Yeah. The second shot, bang, through the left arm and into the chest. The Dutch fell down. Yeah, that's right. He fell down. Charlie, are you sure that's about where the holdup man was standing? Yeah, that's where he was standing about. Are you positive, Charlie? Sure, I'm positive. Okay, I'll sit down. Listen, can't I go home? We've been at this a, an awful long time. I'll tell you something, Charlie. Dutch will be dead a long time, too. The questioning continued for some minutes more. Charlie Burgess stated he would be able to recognize either or both of the two killers if he saw them again. Finally, coffee and sandwiches were sent for. Charlie sat on a bench in the corner munching at his food. Two uniformed officers arrived with a pair of narcotic addicts they caught in the act of breaking into and stealing goods from parked cars on Madison Avenue. It was a good collar. There'd been 10 to 20 squeals a night in the precinct concerning such thieves. As detectives started to talk to them... Charlie watched with fascination from the bench. It was a question. Who was more in trouble? I went back downstairs to the muster room and checked with the desk officer and the man on the boxes. Other than the homicide, it had been a quiet tour. I went into my office to read and sign reports which had accumulated during the tour. It was getting light out, and with the dawn came the first breeze in 48 hours. It might be a cooler day. Shortly before 7 o'clock, Lieutenant King came downstairs and crossed the muster room to my office. Captain. Uh, come in, Matt. You got a minute? Yeah, sure. How are you doing? I don't know. I think Charlie's telling us a pack of lies. You think he killed a man? He sure could have, Captain. But we'll need a lot. We'll need to know if it was his gun, where he got it, and so forth. 
We'll need a straight story on what went on there. Yeah. Oh, could you use a cup of coffee, man? Yeah, Captain. There's some hot. Oh, I think so. Hey, uh, what about the three customers he keeps talking about? If Charlie didn't kill Dutch, somebody had to. Somebody right out of his head. Oh, uh, Sergeant. Excuse me, Captain. Uh, go ahead and take the phone. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. 37. All right, uh, listen, you're ringing in three minutes late. I don't care what the clock in the jewelry store says. According to this clock, you're three minutes late. All right. Yes, sir, Captain. Is there any hot coffee? Yes, sir, it's on the fire. Oh, thanks. The sugar's in the drawer there. Good, thanks. What do you think happened, Matt? I think Charlie tried to dip the till and Dutch caught him at it. It was an argument. Charlie had a gun and bang. Well, the cash register was empty. Money had to go someplace. Charlie didn't have it on him. Wasn't any place in the store. I know, but he ran a block and a half before you nailed him. Could have been dropped in a trash can, a hallway, or even a mailbox. Sugar man? Yeah, please. Here, uh, help yourself. Thanks. I've got two men out checking every trash can and doorway between the bar and grill and where you stopped him, Captain. Good. But he could have had a friend who carried it away. Yeah, that's a possibility. Problem right now is what we're going to do with Charlie. We haven't got enough to book him in on homicide. The assistant DA thinks we ought to take him down to court and have him held as a material witness. Mm, sounds like a good idea. Oh, how's the coffee, Matt? Hot enough? Yeah, yeah. We told Charlie what we're going to do. He called his brother, and I think they'll have a lawyer down there. The DA says if they put up a fight, he'll need your testimony at the hearing because you collared him on the street. Uh-huh. I told him you were due to go off at 8. Oh, that's all right. I'll go down. He said he'd get it set down for as soon after 10 as possible. Oh, don't worry about it. Well, thanks, Captain. It'll help us a lot. Coffee sure takes fine. Yeah. That was a good tower your men made, a Hearn and Ross. Or to clear most of those squeals we had breaking into cars. Better still, man. It ought to stop them. Yes, sir. You've got a big point. At 8 a.m., I turned out the platoon for the day tour. A few minutes later, with the two detectives... And Charlie Burgess, I rode to police headquarters annex, 400 Bloom Street. We parked the car and took the elevator to the fifth floor of Bureau of Criminal Identification. It was approximately 8.30 a.m. Charlie was taken back to the combination M.O. and general appearance file. Here, there are thousands of photographs of men with criminal records classified according to the type of crimes they had committed. Stick-up men, burglars, forgers, auto thieves, pickpockets, and so forth. Within each classification, the photographs are broken down according to general physical description. That is, according to height, weight, hair color, complexion, and build. Charlie was seated on a stool in front of the file. Fox and Howard stood on either side of him. I leaned on another file behind them and watched. Well, take your coat off, Charlie. You've got about 6,000 pictures to look at. That's hot. No, that's all right. Oh, suit yourself. Relax, Charlie. Count on making a career out of it. I'm relaxed. Now, this is what's known as a visible record file. The 12 slides to a cabinet, 71 pockets on each slide. In each pocket, there's two pictures, full face and profile of the same man. I'll pull out a slide and start dropping the pockets in front of you. Say no, and I'll drop the next one. You all set? I'm set, I guess. Now, relax, Charlie. You'll be here a long time. All right, here goes. No, that's not him. Just say no or save your voice. No. That's the guy. That's him. That's one? That's him, I tell you. That's the one that shot Dutch. That's him. Are you sure? I'm telling you. Okay, study it a little longer, make sure. I don't have to study. That's him. Study it anyway. Why do you come here? Now, oh, just sit there, Charlie. Do you believe him? You? I asked you first. Captain? You said it like it mattered. It's like hitting the sweepstakes. 50,000 mugs to look at and he makes the third picture. Well, either Charlie lives right or he's the best liar I ever met. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city. Charlie Burgess was put to work looking through the mugs for the number two man. 
Meanwhile, Detective Fox had an identification man pull the complete jacket on the suspect he identified, Al Hance, also known as Alfred Harrod, a man with a record of two arrests and one conviction, armed robbery. This information was telephoned to Lieutenant King. So was the report that the murder gun bore no readable fingerprints. By 9.45 a.m., Charlie had failed to identify a picture of the number two man. He was taken to the car, and we drove farther downtown to the criminal courts building at 100 Center Street. There, in felony court, he was met by his brother and an attorney. After considerable argument before the magistrate, Charles Burgess was ordered held as a material witness in $15,000 bail, which could not be posted immediately. The two detectives signed a receipt for Charlie and drove him back uptown to the 21st. I went with him. In there, Charlie, in the lieutenant's office. <coughs> Come in. Go ahead, Charlie. Hello, Captain. Thanks a lot. Oh, that's all right. Shut the door, will you, Fox? Yes. Sit down, Charlie. Look. Sit down. Captain, you were in on this thing before any of us, except Charlie, that is. Do you think you can get him to talk sense? I'll try. Look, I don't feel like talking to anybody. I'm bushed. Well, what do you think we are? I'm really bushed. Can I get some sleep? Maybe. Maybe. What kind of an answer is maybe? It's as good as the answers you've been giving us, Charlie. You know I wouldn't do nothing like kill him, Dutch. I liked him. I loved him. Like a brother, I loved him. Charlie, there's more murders over love than hate. I'm telling you. Everything stacks up against you, Charlie. You say there were three other fellows left the bar right before the holdup. We can't find a trace of them. They were in there. They were in there. You could have used the phone to call the cops. Instead, you ran to the police station. Only you ran the wrong way. I'm from Brooklyn. I only worked there three days. I, I, I got mixed up. That's natural. Is standing behind the bar in your street clothes natural? No. Why did it happen when there were no customers in the joint, Charlie? I, I don't know. What do you want from me? Facts, Charlie. Just facts. I'm giving you facts. That's all I've been giving you. Isn't it a fact that you waited until all the customers were gone and you pulled a gun on that? No, it's not. Isn't it a fact that you shot him in cold blood with the intention of saying two hold-up men walked in? No. And you were running away and ran right into my arms? No, it's not so. It's not so. It's not. Well, Charlie, I hope it isn't so. For your sake. Because whoever did do it is going to wind up in the electric chair. That was as far as we could get with Charlie. I left him with Lieutenant King and went downstairs to the muster room. I signed the blotter and left the precinct, not due back on the job until late the next morning. In the meantime, Lieutenant King had detailed two men to trace Al Hans, the former convict whose picture was identified by Charlie Burgess. From different sources, they learned two facts. One, that Hans owned an automobile, a 1949 Plymouth Coupe painted two-tone green, that Al Hans now lived someplace in the neighborhood of St. Mary's Park, the Bronx. That night and early the next morning, detectives cruised the streets within ten blocks of each side of this park looking for such a car. At four o'clock in the morning, one was spotted parked near the Mott Haven yards of the New Haven Railroad. A registration was checked with the Motor Vehicle Bureau. The car was registered in the name of Al Hans. Two men of the 21st Squad were assigned to a stakeout. By 8 a.m., he had not shown up. Two detectives were sent in relief. They watched until 6 p.m. Still, no luck. At that time, Detectives Fox and Howard were sent in relief. They watched the car for seven hours. That's him, Whitey. There he goes. Let's get him. Wait a minute, Al. Grab him. Police officers, hold still, Al. Hey. hey what's the idea? Oh, still. He's clean. Listen, what's the idea? What do you want? We want to talk to you, Al. All right, let's talk. What's the beef? What have you been doing for the past week? I've been working. Working for a trucking company. Where? Here. Here in the Bronx. Days or nights? Well, a uh, little of both. And what else have you been doing? Well, I've been dating a girl. Every night? Yeah, almost every night. When I'm not working. <laughs> you got the wrong party, boys. Uh, we'll see about that. Come on. Listen, why don't you save yourself a lot of trouble? Why don't you talk to her? She can account for my time. We'll talk to her. What were you doing there all the time? 
Well, we were drinking, etc. What's this girl's name? Her name's Wanda. Wanda Rutley. That's the honest goodness truth. Where does she live? She lives on East 152nd. Where on East 152nd? I don't know the number. I can show you the house. Okay, Al. You show us the house. Come on, there's our car. The detectives took Al Hans to their car. They drove to East 152nd Street, where Hans pointed out the house in which he said the girl, Wanda Rutley, lived. They drove him downtown to the 21st for questioning by Lieutenant King concerning his activities of Tuesday night. He denied all knowledge of the holdup and murder. At 4 a.m., Lieutenant King instructed Detectives Fox and Howard to go back uptown to the girls' room. Doctor's orders. Hey, don't any cops work the day shift? What are you always doing coming around the middle of the night and disturbing somebody's self-respect like this? Look at me. Lucky I wasn't too groggy to put on a kimono. Wanda, do you know Al Hans? Yeah, sure, I know Al Hans. You know I know Al Hans. When did you see him last? What day is this, anyway? This is Friday morning, 4 o'clock. Have you seen him this week? Yeah, I saw him a couple nights ago. Tuesday? Wednesday? When? Day before yesterday. Now, wait a minute. What was that, Tuesday? Day before yesterday? That's right. He was here, yeah. Excuse me, I gotta sit down. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. You're very generous. What time did you get here Tuesday night? Oh, I don't know. About nine, ten o'clock, something like that. What time to leave? It was late, very late. About midnight? No, much later. What do you do, anyway? One o'clock? No, much later. Closer. Four. After four or something like that. Close to four, huh? I don't know exactly where. It was rather sometime. What was he doing here all the time? Well, we were... About to say... I'll say anyway. We were drinking and we were playing canasta. 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 We were playing canasta. All right, Wanda. Go in and get dressed. Why? Some people want to talk to you downtown. Ah. Middle of the night. Always in the middle of the night. It doesn't look good, Whitey. Well, that depends whose side you're on. Looks great for Al. Charlie, it looks terrible. I was on the job at 7.45 in the morning. After I turned out the platoon, I looked over the blotter and arrest records for a picture of what had occurred in the precinct during the night. Lieutenant King walked in the front door. With him were Detective Fox and Charlie Burgess. He told me that after a night of questioning, the girl had verified Al Hans' story in every particular. Now he was about to bring Charlie face to face with Hans. With Lieutenant King, I followed Detective Fox and Charlie Burgess through the back room, upstairs, and into the detective squad. All right, Charlie, let's go inside. Captain? Yep. When's it going to be over? That's what I want to know. Soon, Charlie. Okay. Uptown, downtown, I'm I'm getting sick of it. Who is it? Lieutenant. Oh, all set, Lieutenant. Come in. Go ahead, Charlie. I try to help him. That's him, Captain. That's the guy. I'm the guy that what? You're the guy that shot Dutch. You're out of your mind. Him, I'm telling you. That's him. Hey, who is this jerk? He's crazy. It's him. It's him. Get your hands off me, will you? It's him. Tell him to get his hands off me. Golly. It's him. Stop. And what kind of a frame is this? He's the guy. All right, folks, be quiet. Fox, bring her in here. We'll wrap it up. Okay. 
Well, you wouldn't take my word for it, huh? But you'll take Wanda's. Who's Wanda? You'll see, Charlie. Everything I'll see. Tell me something. Come on in. Inside, Wanda. All right. Don't have to rush. Sit down, Wanda. Hello, Wanda. Oh, Hans, why don't you stay out of trouble? So I wouldn't have to lose my self-respect and be waked up by policemen at such an hour to make alibis for you. Sit down. All right. Could say please. Wanda, you're involved in a very serious matter here. Oh, I'm always involved in a very serious matter, but always at my house. You was there from around 9 o'clock until after 3 in the morning, and nothing you can say will change that. It's a lie. Okay, Charlie. Wanda, did you know this was a murder case? Murder case? Is it? Murder? Well... Now, was Al at your place between those times on Tuesday night? I told you he was, didn't I? We want the truth, Wanda. I'm telling you the truth. Have you ever been in jail? You know, I've been in jail. You know I've been in jail. How long? Overnight? I was in two nights once. Were you ever in two years or three years or five years? You know what it's like, Wanda? I'm not. Scared. I'm not scared of anything. If you testify for Al and we prove it's a lie, we can send you away. For what? For perjury. Or worse, as accessory to murder. And we will, too. You can't do that. Can I? If you lie on the witness stand, we will. Oh, fun is fun. Shut up. But I can't. Shut up, I said. Get away from her. That's all I give you. Get I'll kill you. Watch him. Break that wall. I'll get him. That'll hold. I didn't mean any harm. I, honestly, I didn't. He just said that he was in a little trouble and if I was asking any questions to cover up for him. All right, Wanda, sit down. I didn't mean any harm. I didn't know it was a murder bee. Sit down. Yeah. Is he okay? He'll come around in a minute. Thanks, Captain. For what? You see... You see? Yeah, we see, Charlie. We're sorry if we gave you a hard time. It's all right, Lieutenant. You guys were just doing your job. I know that. I'll admit it. It looked bad for me. Awful bad. Charlie, no matter how bad it looked for you, it's going to look a lot worse for him. Uh... 21st Precinct, Sergeant Klein. How'd you know it was Berger's man? And so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. Incidents portrayed on tonight's 21st precinct occurred last year. Names were changed to protect the interests of persons involved. 21st Precinct is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Elspeth Herrick, Wendell Holmes, Chuck Webster, Bill Quinn, Phil Sterling, and Lawson Zerby. Written and directed by Stanley Niss, produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking.